What if I told you a man beloved by his community, a man who was a doctor, who taught Sunday school, who'd established a foundation for children with special needs, was accused of sexually abusing more than 500 people. My name is Marissa Kwiatkowski, and I'm an investigative reporter. My colleagues and I were the first to tell the public the truth of what that man had done. I've been passionate about journalism for as long as I can remember. When I was six, about the same height I am now, <laughs> I asked my parents for a typewriter for Christmas. It was black and red. Of course, back then, I didn't understand what it meant to be a journalist, but I knew I loved stories. Four years later, when I was 10, I wrote my first book. It was a harrowing tale of a girl possessed by evil as she and her friends played in haunted woods. A year after that, I wrote my second book. This one was about a plane crash and a young girl conquering her fears. Of course, neither of these books could be considered journalism by any stretch of the imagination. But they did foreshadow two things that would become key aspects of my career in journalism. First, even then, I didn't shy from difficult topics. And second, my primary interest was, and still is, in people. Being a journalist is both a privilege and a responsibility. We are privileged to have people share with us some of the happiest and in some cases, some of the darkest moments they will ever experience. But with that privilege comes responsibility because for some people, we are their only chance of helping others understand what they've been through. Most of my career has been dedicated to sharing difficult stories and to examining systems meant to protect children and vulnerable adults. Eventually, that work led me to the Indianapolis Star and it was there I got the call that would lead my colleagues and me to the man I mentioned earlier. It was March of 2016, and I was investigating systemic failures to report sexual abuse in schools when a source reached out and suggested I look at USA Gymnastics and how it handled such allegations. That source pointed me toward a lawsuit in Georgia and records he said might soon be sealed by the judge. I left that call feeling like this could be something really important. And it soon became clear that the only way to get those records quickly was to go in person. So with my editor's approval, that same day I got the tip, I boarded a plane to Georgia. I arrived at the courthouse early the next morning and asked for copies of the entire court file. Soon after, an employee handed me a box of about 400 pages of records. I lugged it out to my rental car, I started flipping through it, and then I called one of the attorneys affiliated with the case and I asked him, do I have everything? He started naming documents. Do you have the response to the motion to dismiss? No. Do you have Exhibit D? No. Exhibit E? No. He said, then you don't have everything. It turns out there were 500 more pages sitting in the judge's chambers. They were the documents I'd been looking for. Included in those documents were pieces of depositions from current and former USA Gymnastics executives that revealed the organization had a policy of not reporting allegations of sexual abuse to authorities unless those complaints had been signed by a victim, a victim's parent, or an eyewitness to the abuse. The next step was finding out the impact of that policy on the safety of children, and it was a big undertaking. Two colleagues, Tim Evans and Mark Alicia, quickly joined the investigation. The three of us spent the next four and a half months backgrounding more than 100 coaches, requesting records, and interviewing survivors. We worked countless hours. The investigation was the first thing I thought about every morning when I woke up and the last thing I thought about as I went to sleep. 
I felt a responsibility to those who trusted us with their stories. One survivor, Kaylin Britsky, had been sexually abused by a coach whom USA Gymnastics had been warned about. And to this day, I remember what she told me she wanted USA Gymnastics to know. Take a look. Any corporation that puts their reputation above safety, <laughs> honestly, this isn't something that I would be, want to be a part of <laughs> at all. And I was part of USA Gymnastics for a very long time. It doesn't matter who you're protecting. It doesn't matter that they're part of your organization and you want to save face. How about saving me? How about saving me? That's the part that still sticks with me. How about saving me? Meanwhile, USA Gymnastics was fighting the Indianapolis Star's effort to access records that had already been sealed by the court. And in court records, they said Indy Star gave no explanation for how the disclosure of such records would serve any other function than to allow Indy Star to publish a national inquirer-like article based on events from 10 to 20 years ago. In court proceedings, they also said we were on a witch hunt. It could have been easy to take those statements personally, but for us, it was just motivation to work harder. And eventually, we found multiple examples of situations in which USA Gymnastics had received allegations, did not report them, and then other children were abused. We started our final fact check. We were meticulous. We fact checked every word of every sentence, of every paragraph. In our first article, published August 4th of 2016. That morning, we were inundated with messages asking us to look into other gymnastics officials whom people believed were child predators. One such email came from Rachel Denhollander. She told us that she too had been abused, but not by a coach, by a doctor. Within weeks, we heard from two others who said that same doctor had sexually abused them under the guise of medical treatment. Our investigation into that man was different. Up to that point, everyone we'd written about had been charged or convicted of a crime. This man had not. He was beloved by his community, a doctor, a Sunday school teacher. He'd established a foundation for children with special needs, he also worked at Michigan State University and was running for local school board. His name was Dr. Larry Nasser. Because Nasser had not faced criminal charges, the rigor with which Tim and Mark and I conducted our investigation became all the more important. We researched medical treatments to determine whether what he'd done was a legitimate procedure, and if it was, whether he'd followed proper protocol. Our research indicated that he had not. After gathering records and verifying all the information we could, we published our first article about him September 12th of 2016. There were two immediate competing reactions. On one hand, we heard from people who told us we were wrong that there's no way it was true, and that we were tarnishing a good man's reputation. At the same time, we heard from more women who told us they too were survivors. And forgive me for being graphic, but there was one specific thing Nasser's attorney said that brought other survivors forward. He told us on the record that Nasser had never used penetration in the course of a medical procedure. Many, many women knew that was false. A number of them had not realized until then that what happened to them was abuse. And the number of survivors continued to grow. About a month and a half after our first article about Nasser, he was charged with criminal sexual conduct. A month after that, 
he was charged with possession of child pornography. Only then did his vocal supporters fall silent. But it didn't end there. We learned that Michigan State University had received allegations about Nasser years earlier. We learned that USA Gymnastics had waited five weeks to report allegations against him. And we learned that time and time again, Nasser used his medical degree, his reputation, and his nice guy image to push back any time people tried to bring allegations to light. No longer. Today, more than 500 people have come forward with allegations against Nasser. There have been multiple criminal and congressional investigations into what happened. There's a new federal law. There have been lawsuits, resignations, criminal charges filed against others. USA Gymnastics filed for bankruptcy. Nasser himself has pleaded guilty and he's likely to spend the rest of his life in prison. I can stand before you and recite the facts of what happened with the benefit of hindsight, but there are so many ways that it could have gone differently if I hadn't gotten that first call, if Rachel hadn't read our first article and reached out to us, if garbage pickup hadn't been later the day law enforcement executed a search warrant at Nasser's home and found at least 37,000 images of child pornography on hard drives in his trash. We've heard a lot of people say it's over now. Nasser's locked up, kids are safe. But our investigation was never just about Nasser. It was and is about the ways in which people and organizations fail to protect children. It's difficult to quantify the prevalence of child sexual abuse because it is an underreported crime, but one study found that one out of every 10 children will be sexually abused before the age of 18. Another found that of children who were abused, 95% knew and trusted the person who hurt them. Child sexual abuse is a pervasive community issue, and in the years I've spent investigating it, the same problems have come up again and again. Someone saw something, or heard something, or was told something, and didn't do anything about it. Experts recommend that parents ask questions of the people and institutions involved in their children's lives. Things like, does the organization conduct background checks? Does it require child abuse prevention training? How does it monitor interactions between children and staff, both in person and through social media? And what is the process for reporting inappropriate behavior? Institutions must create an environment in which it is incredibly difficult for perpetrators to have access to children, and in which officials at those institutions report those allegations immediately to authorities. And authorities must take those allegations seriously and investigate them. We all must create an environment in which survivors feel comfortable coming forward. It's difficult for me to stand before you and shift from Marissa the journalist to Marissa the person, but if I could channel six-year-old me or the little girl cranking out books no one read, I would ask you, create safe spaces for children. Listen to survivors and speak up when something is wrong. Thank you. I don't normally do this, but uh, you know my story as well. So it's, uh, I have a two-year-old daughter, right, and she loves nothing better than swinging from stuff. My son's almost seven. He's getting in the Boy Scouts and all the rest, right? 
And we hear things like this, you know, what you've shared, schools, scouts, sports. How does one still keep their faith in humanity? You know, it's difficult, but I, I truly believe, even after all the work I've done, I truly believe that most people are good. And it's not about creating this environment of fear. It's just about creating an environment in which we protect children as much as we can and in which we're vigilant about paying attention when something feels like it's wrong. A lot of us can sense if something is off. And it's about listening to that when it comes up. Looking back, right, you mentioned hindsight as well. Right? With all that you've seen, is there one thing that you said in looking back, maybe we, the collective, we could have done differently? There's a lot of people who knew not only about Larry Nasser, in some cases decades before it was ever brought to light, but didn't report it. And that's true of other coaches whom people later believed and found convicted of being child predators. And, and so I think it's really important that people understand that you reporting something doesn't mean automatically someone's gonna be charged or arrested or you've ruined their life because you reported it. There are experts who are trained to figure these things out. And so you reporting it is just one step of a very big process. So, see something, say something? That's right. Okay. Marissa, thank you for speaking up, and more power to you. Thank you, Marissa. Let's hear from Marissa Kutkowski. Thank you.